It's the dawn of a new era. First, it was Ozempic and Wegovy, and now there are more new weight loss drugs. They may even be better at treating obesity and achieving weight loss, while also helping manage diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure. With some clinical trials promising weight loss of 20%, interest in these medications has skyrocketed. Along with the excitement of these new medications as hybrid treatments with bariatric surgery, there are side effects and there are nutrition concerns that you should be aware of and know how to handle. Coming up, bariatric dietitians Gail and Isabel join me to share nutrition strategies specific to weight loss medications and bariatric surgery. You don't want to miss these and they can empower your success if you're taking the medications. Did you know that ProCare has a multivitamin soft chew that comes in three delicious fruit flavors? With flexible dosing, you can accommodate your whole family's vitamin needs and it even includes iron. Paired with calcium chews and our protein powder. Visit ProCareNow.com and use code SUSAN10 to save 10%. Hi, I'm registered dietitian nutritionist, Dr. Susan Mitchell, ex-radio dietitian turned podcaster. You're listening to the Bariatric Surgery Success Podcast, episode number 148. Tired of the hype, tired of the confusion when it comes to nutrition, especially bariatric nutrition, it's enough to make you say, forget about it. I don't know what to do. Well, I know what to do, and so do Gail and Isabel. It matters where you get your nutrition information. When it comes to your bariatric surgery, nutrition is specific. So let's cut through all the hype that's on the internet. Let's get the accurate nutrition information that you need to know. You're in the right place. I'm so glad you're listening. I want to give a shout out to Mende. He said, I had sleeve surgery and I just happened to find your podcast. And what a blessing. I really appreciate you sharing informative and science-based info. I also appreciate that you have experts on your podcast because we all can't know everything. Thanks again for your time and expertise to educate our community who are on this journey. Mende, thank you. And I'm glad the podcast has been a blessing to you. Boy, are you ever right. We can't all know everything. That's why I'm thrilled to have your favorite bariatric dietitians with me today, Isabel and Gail. In their clinical practices, they have their fingers on the pulse of the most up-to-date information. Isabel Maples is a bariatric coordinator at UVA Health in Haymarket, Virginia. Gail Smith is the bariatric dietitian at the Weight Loss and Bariatric Surgery Institute in Orlando, Florida. You can find both Isabel's and Gail's contact information in the show notes. Well, I'm thinking about this whole new world with all the weight loss medications coming out. And many of these new dual and triple combination drugs that are going to come out work in tandem with bariatric surgery. You know, they can increase levels of key digestive hormones that control appetite and insulin production. But there's always a but, right? (laughs) But with these new drugs can also come various side effects that we've all been seeing, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, and changes, some major to your appetite. Well, we want you to know how to deal with these possible side effects if you face them. So let's look at what we're going to call five nutrition must-knows and how to deal with them. So Gail, I'm going to start off with you with the one we hear about a lot, which is nausea or nausea and vomiting. What do you consider first when you hear this? And then how do you suggest to deal with it? Yes, Susan, it is very common. And the first thing I think is, what are they eating? Sometimes the med itself, medication itself, can decrease my patient's appetite so much that I know they're not eating. Then I think, well, are, how often are they eating? Are they eating enough? Are they spacing meals and snacks throughout the day? I encourage them to eat at least two, three, or four smaller meals per day with at least some source of protein with each meal and each snack, just like bariatric surgery. 
lower fat. And and do you find that too when you have when you make those meals smaller and more frequent that it does cut some of that oh, nausea? Yeah. Absolutely. Don't you Definitely. too, Isabel? Yes. And, I, and the lower yes. fat proteins. And you know, maybe they can't have that full two ounces like they usually do. Get an ounce in of chicken breast, some sh- some hummus, shrimp. Low fat Greek yogurts work pretty good with little pieces of fruit in them. Tastes great. So nausea can occur with the high fat and the high protein diet when patients aren't aren't eating enough protein. Okay, wait a minute. Nausea occurs with high I mean, fat high and carb. high carb. I'm sorry. So yes, n- not high protein, right? but the yeah. high carbohydrate and high fat diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they're not <laughs> eating enough protein. I'm sorry, my brain. <laughs> yeah, because I'm thinking about the high carbs uh, and the type of carbs too, right? That can kick in the nausea mm-hmm, if they're exactly. the wrong ones. Yes. Yeah, they should be the healthier carbs, the, the better, the higher fiber types that can help them also. Hydration is also important with these medications, and I think we'll be talking about that more in a bit. But are they getting enough fluid and what kinds of fluid? And I always say water, 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 or flavoring added to the water, but low sugar flavoring. And if nausea is super extreme, we can say, hey, what are we doing here? Why is it so extreme? Maybe they aren't taking that medication correctly. Did they advance it too fast? Are they on a dose maybe too high for them? And I want you to know that most uh, places that are prescribing these medications and dosing them will, will not give them a higher dose until they see the patient. So we see them monthly before we adjust the medication. And I think that's really a good thing too, because, well, you're going to pick up on issues, but hopefully these issues like nausea and vomiting, is if they become problems, they're checking in with you already saying, hey, hey <laughs> exactly. You. <laughs> and and Susan and Gail, the other thing is pe- people need to realize these weight loss medications affect how quickly food moves through the digestive system. That's the whole purpose. Well, if food stays in the stomach longer, that should help us feel full longer, f- make you feel more satisfied. That's oh, yeah. good for weight loss, right? But overfulness can lead to nausea too, like if the food is in the stomach for too long, and especially after bariatric surgery. So my advice to patients is to really slow down the pace of eating with the meal, take 20 or 30 minutes to eat, chew slowly, chew a lot, you know, take pauses between the bites, and take 20 or 30 minutes so your brain and your stomach have time to communicate with each other. Pay attention during that process so you can detect that first feeling of fullness and you can stop eating before that extra bite means more nausea. See, I think that's a really, really good tip because so many times, you know, we know we're supposed to eat these things after surgery. Here's what we're supposed to have. And we, none of us, I, I doubt, really grew up thinking slow down, eat slowly. You know, we, and our mindset here in the U.S. is grab mm-hmm. it and go, right? Oh, yes. And, and as little time as you can, if you even get to eat between patients or whatever. So taking 20 to 30 minutes to eat feels just like a luxury. Oh, yeah. But oh, yes. when I'm listening to what you say, that luxury of slowing down could be the key that helps you start to feel full before nausea and then maybe vomiting kick in. And Mm -hmm. I just think that's such an important, it's a mindfulness tip, but it's something that all of us, surgery or not, can benefit from. So in taking the medication, I have a couple ideas that I'll just throw out there. And that is that for most people, you hear about nausea in the first couple of days after they start taking the medication or increase the dose. So maybe talk to your provider. Hey, instead of starting this on a Tuesday, maybe I started on a Saturday or Sunday so that I can get more, more nausea, you know, mm-hmm. so I can have the nausea on the weekend <laughs> instead of during the week. And so maybe that allows you to function better. So just just a thought. And then I've also seen doctors sometimes prescribe an anti-nausea med- nausea medication just for, you know, a day or two to get you over that little hump of the, of the increased nausea. So maybe that's a possibility. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, here we are talking about nausea, we're talking about vomiting, but also we're hearing about the big C, 
constipation, right? <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. And again, weight loss medications affect the rate the food thra- travels through our digestive system. So not just the stomach, but how it goes through the small intestine, large intestine as well. And one of the jobs, once food or food waste gets to the large intestines, is um, to get rid of that extra water in the stool. And so if food is staying or food waste is staying in the stomach a long time, the stool can get really dry because more and more water gets absorbed. And if the stool is really dry, sometimes a bowel movement is going to be difficult because there's not enough mush to push easily. And, <laughs> and so with constipation. <laughs> mush to push. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> I'm so glad you're scientific, isn't it? <laughs> so, well, speaking of that, um, with constipation, I usually sit down and talk about dietitian's favorite F words. Okay. <laughs> food, fluid. And the F and words water. would be? Yeah, food, fluid, and fiber. <laughs> uh, and so food, meaning like I recommend people eat on a regular basis, like Gail was talking about, not grazing, but not skipping meals either. But eating regularly through the day. And you know what? That's hard, which I'm going to, I know you're going to bring up again in a few minutes, but it's really hard if the appetite's being affected. So we're going to have to come back to that because it's all great to say, okay, do this, do this, do this. But if you have no appetite, how Mm -hmm. are we going to handle that? Which we'll get to. So go ahead with the food. So with fluid, we, I mean, I typically use eight cups or 64 ounces a, a day of all fluids as kind of a ballpark recommendation or a minimum amount for most people to drink. But, you know, as you're eating less, fluid may need to even actually increase because typically we get 20% of our fluid actually from food. So we're eating less and so fluid may need to increase. Right. And, and I, I think I want to say a point or you can, you can uh, mm-hmm. elaborate on this just a little bit, but many times people don't think about the fact that your food Many different foods are really good sources of water content. I'm just going to use like watermelon off the top yeah, of my head. Exactly. And so that if that's changed and then you're not taking in high fluid foods, then, you know, more constipation, less fluid intake. I can see an issue right there. Yeah. And if, if, you know, you're getting some of the protein foods, but maybe you're not getting foods that have enough fiber, for instance, or, an, or, and those fiber foods are often ones that do have more of the fluid in them as, as well, you know, higher water content. So speaking of fiber, I usually remind my patients to eat more high fiber foods, maybe an omelet, in the morning for that protein, but then you're adding spinach or maybe some bell peppers and onions, or you're eating some oatmeal and you've stirring some raisins with that or nuts and a salad or, and a broccoli with dinner or a a salad for lunch so that you get some fiber foods throughout the day as well. Oh, Uh, Yeah, Yeah. fiber foods are outstanding for the patients. They absolutely positively need some. And I even say there's one that's a healthy fat, like an avocado. It's a, it's a, you know, a fat, but it has fiber in it. So I tell them you can't eat the whole avocado, but you can take a wedge of it and put it on that toast, whole grain, whole wheat bread, and a little cheese on top for the protein. And then snacking on fruits, like many patients ask me about strawberries, lots of water there. So yeah, or grapes, but they're kind of high in sugar, but if you, they're full of fluid, so they're good too. Or a veggie, uh, like a carrot with a light dip that maybe has some, you know, light Mm -hmm. sour cream or even a light cream cheese with it, or even hummus, right? You know, and what, right. And what I really like about this is that, We're talking real food here, delicious, tasty, all kinds of ideas for real foods. And that's what we want to see you build your lifestyle on. So I want to go back and bring this up, as we said we would, because we know that weight loss medications may cause a significant decrease in appetite. So you may find that you're just flat out not hungry and you find yourself eating only one meal a day. Well, this can lead to malnutrition pretty quickly and a host of other issues, dehydration, constipation. We were already talking about it. So, Gail, talk more about this from the mechanism of action of the drug and then what to do. 
the part of the mechanism of action or the way that GLP-1 works is that they do decrease the appetite. Patients share that they are eating like only one meal per day often, many times, and maybe a snack. Um, They just are so severely, extremely appetite suppressed with these medications because that's how they work. So they really do have to listen to maybe some hunger cues, but those may be also zapped from that medication. I was going to just say, yeah, they're altering those hunger cues, which they have had. They don't have them or very few of them. So they have to have a timer. They really do have to have something that reminds them to Mm -hmm. eat. And then again, They don't have to eat the full four ounces, even if they can only get in two ounces or three ounces, get something with protein. Um, Like they're often hungry for breakfast and then they aren't hungry the rest of the day. So they definitely have to put in, okay, mid-morning I need something or at least by lunch, let me have a little bit of protein with a carb, a healthy carb, whether that's cheese and cracker or like I said, the yogurt and fruit works good too. But so it's not that the foods mm-hmm. change. We are still very much on, you know, portion and high protein and all that same type of lifestyle that you have with the surgery, because these are often meds used as hybrid to the surgery uh, or with them. But um, mm-hmm. it's rethinking what I'm hearing you guys say, right, is that if you know you're not hungry and you're hungry first thing in the morning and trying to get in your larger meal or more of what you've been eating as a full meal then, and then having a timer that says, okay, I got to have a snack. I got to have this because you're going to have to tell yourself I need to eat. Otherwise your caloric intake is going to be so low and then you're going to run into other problems, right? Exactly. They've got to prioritize eating and getting that protein in. And many patients that are, you know, focused on weight loss, whether they're on weight loss medications or or not already, tell me that they are concerned about weight. So if they're not hungry, they're not going to eat. And so I see that a lot of my patients come into clinic initially, even before surgery, with the idea that they are more eating on a more erratic schedule where they're skipping meals or they're grazing and that. And so I, one of my goals is to get them back to a pattern where they are eating on a regular basis, not closer than two hours apart, but maybe, you know, four or five hours apart at the most. And so it doesn't have to be a lot, like Gail says, but they need to eat on a regular basis. And and so they don't have to think of big meals. Some of the meals that, you know, uh, Gail suggested that we might think are snack size right. could be a, a now be a meal. Uh, And it helps you set them up for good nutrition, for weight management, and for a healthy relationship with enjoying food. I totally agree with that. The last thing we want to see from the medications is to go back to an erratic way of eating and undo all this hard work that you've been doing, learning healthy bariatric lifestyle and eating plans and all of this because you're not hungry. So it is going to take some effort. Well, We'll be back in a moment and tell you what to look for Coming up, some more good tips for you. Bariatric Surgery Success is thrilled to partner with New Hope Girls, women empowering women. They offer a discount to our community. Code TRANSFORM to save 15% and celebrate our shared commitment to transformation. Shop their beautiful bags at newhopegirls.com. One of my concerns, number four, for long-term use of these meds when appetite is less is protecting our muscle mass or the muscle sparing effect, as we call it. Isabel, talk about body composition measurements and protein intake as you see it tied to the changes with these new drugs. Well, body composition is certainly important, Susan. And healthy weight, we all know, is not a number on the scale. It's not a certain clothing size. And it really is about that body composition, um, having enough muscle and, and, and maintaining some of that muscle so your body can continue to function well. Anytime we lose weight, we're going to lose fat and muscle. So we want to shift that a little bit so because th- th- we have to fight that muscle loss because muscle boosts metabolism. And that makes weight maintenance easier down the road as well. So two ways to limit muscle loss are exercise and getting enough protein. We talk about that with bariatric surgery already. Strength training exercises, 
they're good at fighting muscle loss and consistently and progressively challenging your muscle to help maintain them. That's what muscle uh, strength training is all about. But you can use weight loss, weight lifting machines. You can use dumbbells. You can use, you know, water bottles or soup cans. You can use stretch pans. If you don't want to do any of that, you could even do calisthenics or modified calisthenics like sit to stand exercises where you progressively challenge your muscle. Start small, build up each week and work each muscle group two, maybe three times a week to build it up and do your aerobic exercises in between. Getting that protein in, 60 to 80 grams, maybe even 90 grams of protein a day is another way to help fight muscle loss. We know during periods of rapid weight loss, this higher amount of protein protects against that muscle loss. Prioritize protein, as Gail has talked about, by including a protein food at each meal and each snack. Mm -hmm. Eat the protein first before you move on to the vegetables, the fruit. You know, get at least some of that protein in first to get that 60 grams a day. So let me ask you both in your clinic, since we know that we're not looking for numbers on a scale. We're looking for a muscle, you know, ratio of muscle to fat. We want to see changes in body composition over time so that the percentage amount of body fat is decreasing. Do you see a change already or do you foresee that using some type of body composition measuring tool is going to become part of this as we start to have more and more hybrid treatment, bariatric surgery, and the use of these medications so that there's a, a better way of measuring what's going on at, with this loss. I know in our clinic, we're starting it right <laughs> away. We talk about it a lot, but now we're going to start measuring it. We've got a body uh, a scale that can help measure body composition. And so that's going to be a routine part of our um, process and including a hand grip to measure hand grip to see if, you know, is muscle function, is muscle function decreasing after surgery or after weight loss yeah, medications? And, yeah. Inter and we do too. We have one of those and we use it when we have the follow-up patients that do come back. That's sometimes the problem. We don't follow them as regularly as I think we should, but definitely we can do that. So I'm also thinking that when the number of calories becomes low or too low, it's even more important to take a look at your bariatric supplements because malnutrition can actually become a problem from lack of calories and the proper nutrients. Gail, you know, we are both proponents of bariatric supplements for the long haul. Oh, absolutely. Haul. You've got to have them because you're just not able to eat enough of all the good stuff to get enough. So patients come to us already with like B12 and D3 deficiencies and sometimes iron. And as we age, we need calcium as well for our bones and teeth, and especially as a bariatric patient. patient. So yes, I take vitamin and minerals too, and most uh, bariatric patients need a good multivitamin and a separate calcium. The bariatric vitamin companies now are coming out with like one multivitamin per day that has all the recommended ASMBS, recommended levels of the vitamins and nutrients in them. So that combined with a couple, two, three calciums for about 12 to 1500, even 1800 milligrams for some of the DS patients, they can get everything they need in just like a couple vitamins a day. And one reason I hear people tell me that they don't take a multivitamin is because they forget about it. And so what I try to get them to do as a reminder, you know, you can set a reminder on your phone too, but taking your medication or your vitamins it pairs with some other activity you're doing already. You either put it with an activity like brushing your teeth or, you know, getting ready for bed or a certain time of day before I leave the house in the morning, before I do this or put it with a meal so that it's all at one time. And then it reminds you every time, hey, I need to do this if I'm doing that. Right. And if, it, if they cause nausea, then you've got to think about making sure you hide those in with a meal so that there's mm -hmm. less risk for that. So... 
thought for what we see coming. Do you think that the addition of these various medications as a hybrid treatment with bariatric surgery, will it change the way we do lab work? How often, what type? So let's say that in your clinic, you're seeing people not eat and you know their intake's not there. Will that cause you to change your protocol, do you think, for the way that you do certain lab work? Mm, Probably. I would say yes. If we do, don't you think, Isabel, when we get low levels of certain ones, we'll we'll repeat them in a couple, like uh, two weeks after we may supplement them or a month just to make sure they're they're responding to the medication or to the vitamins. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. The vitamins. Yeah. No. Yeah. And our clinic doesn't see as many, you know, dual where somebody is using weight loss medications after surgery as you do, Gail. But that's certainly something to keep on the radar to see if we need to change that protocol. Yeah, because I'm just thinking here, we're talking about malnutrition can happen, caloric intake can be too low. It wouldn't take long to see some of that in lab values. So just thinking forward where this may lead us. Any last thoughts that you haven't told us about this new area? <laughs> it's, it's just so exciting. It but is. Also and I just want to add that they just need, the patients need to realize we're here to help them and guide them and answer questions. We'll work with them. And we do work with our nurse advanced practice uh, RNs that are helping with the medications, um, uh, subscription uh, prescriptions, the doctors and the mental health counselors. So Reach out to us if you have questions. Definitely. Registered dietitians, I mean, that's what we do is help people eat better. And, you know, a healthy diet is really not just counting calories. It's making those calories count. And obesity is a very complicated disease. These new weight loss medications can be some game changers, providing significant weight change, even for somebody who has had bariatric surgery, um, And health improvement in diet and exercise alone has not been able to do that. So this is a, you know, another piece of the puzzle. Well, as always, thank you. I think this information is so helpful. And I imagine with the changes and we're learning so much that we'll be revisiting this topic again. For sure. Oh, for sure. So remember, you heard Gil and Isabel If you start the medications and you're having side effects that we've talked about from nausea to vomiting to constipation, you're just not hungry, you can't get your fluids in, reach out, go back to your bariatric dietitian, go to your healthcare team, make them aware of the symptoms that you're experiencing so they can help you because you are worth it. Bariatric Surgery Success with Dietitian Dr. Susan Mitchell is produced and owned by Practicalories, LLC, all rights reserved. Remember, the content provided on this podcast is for information purposes only and doesn't create a patient-provider relationship. It's intended to provide reference material and is not designed to provide medical advice. Please consult your healthcare provider regarding any medical issues you have relating to symptoms, conditions, diseases, diagnosis, treatments, and side effects. Podcast guests express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions, which do not necessarily reflect or agree with the host, Dr. Susan Mitchell, or Practicalories, LLC.